New Testament lesson and the text for our sermon comes from the Gospel according to John, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 18. John 20, 1 through 18. Listen to the Word of God. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Here in the readings. Let us pray. God, our helper, show us your ways and teach us your paths. By your Holy Spirit, open our minds that we may be led in your truth and taught your will. And may we praise you by listening to your word and by obeying it. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In the middle of my sophomore year in college, I transferred to Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky, a small Christian school whose alumni numbered my grandfather and assorted aunts, uncles, and cousins. I had decided to major in sociology, and shortly into my tenure there, obviously wishing to enhance my job prospects, chose the double major in sociology and psychology. It's a good thing I went to seminary. Now, although Asbury College is now Asbury University, back then its faculty was not of the same stature it is today. For instance, the sociology department consisted of two professors, which meant a sociology major would spend considerable classroom time with both of these gentlemen. And one of these was an ordained minister who also earned master's degrees in theology and sociology. His view of his own level of wisdom and expertise was rather enhanced. A smart student would readily perceive he was not a man who wished to be challenged. You notice I said a smart student. 
I, on the other hand, had yet to learn that essential lesson of life that sometimes you just have to keep your mouth shut. So in the very first course I took from him, one day he decided to make derogatory comments about labor unions. Being the son of a union man and being a union man myself, when I worked at the steel mill and oil refinery, I just could not let it go. So naturally, I took it on myself to straighten out this preacher slash professor on how unions and management really worked. In hindsight, that may have been a mistake. For the rest of my college career, I paid the price. Grades were important to me. They meant scholarship money. But I could not get an A in his class. He relished tormenting me. 96 was an A. My tests and papers always came back with a 93, 94, or 95. One semester determined to get my A, I took excruciatingly accurate class notes and memorized them to perfection. My test score came back with a 95. I marched into his office carrying my class notes. Comparing them with my test answer, I showed him how I had responded to the question with his exact words from the class lecture. He gave me that sly smile he seemed to reserve just for me and replied, well, I wanted just a little bit more. My guess is that you can discern how I felt about him even today. And yet, as much as I disliked this man, as little respect as I had for his fairness, he changed my life. I came to Asbury carrying most of the typical Southern cultural view of African Americans. 1970 was still a time of great foment over civil rights. No one in my family belonged to the Klan. No one told racist jokes. We all loved Jesus and said everyone was a child of God. But our culture declared that African Americans were just a step or two below white people. And it wasn't until I took this teacher's class that he forced me to read books that confronted my cultural prejudice. Books on black history, the terrible treatment of slaves, the misuse of the Bible to promote slavery and racial prejudice. As little respect as I had for this professor, what he forced me to read and study made me confront America's racial legacy and my own latent prejudice. Now, I mention this because the characters in our scripture are not individuals most would respect or even like. 2,000 years of studying this passage can easily blind us to how John's first readers would have viewed the story's participants. For instance, we think of Mary Magdalene as the only person all four gospel writers identify as being at the tomb on that Easter morning. She's the first person to see the resurrected Jesus, the first person to proclaim the resurrection to others. But legend also labels her as a prostitute. The Bible does not say that, although we do know that Jesus cast seven demons out of her. And I believe we can surmise that a description of someone possessing seven demons means her actions were probably not within the confines of polite or religious society. Plus, she was a woman. Again, her gender does not strike a chord with us, but in the first century, women were possessions of their fathers and then their husbands. Designated as carrying a promiscuous tendency, they were viewed as worthy of little more than childbearing. Considered weak and untrustworthy, their testimony was not acceptable in a court of law. If you were going to choose a person to announce the greatest moment in world history, someone who would garner immediate respect and validity, someone who could without question draw the attention of the disciples, friends, family, and outsiders, Mary Magdalene was certainly not that person. But she is not alone in her lack of credentials to announce the resurrection. 
Peter is the right gender and the wrong everything else. I think there was a sizable number of people, both within the apostolic group and outside of it, that Peter rubbed the wrong way. The scriptures paint a more complete picture of Peter than anyone else except Jesus in the New Testament. His arrogance shines through. Not only is he certain he is right, but feels a constant need to declare his superiority. He's impetuous, outspoken, the classic talk first, think later. He carried a serious case of foot and mouth disease. And worst of all, to John's early readers, he was a coward. After boldly declaring that he would die before he would deny Jesus, he turns around and denies Christ three times. Each time he is presented with an opportunity to show his allegiance, prove his faithfulness to Jesus, and each time fear conquers him and he declares, I do not know that man. And yet, Mary Magdalene and Peter are two of the first three people to the tomb. And Mary Magdalene is the first to see the resurrected Christ. They possessed every reason in the world to stay home that morning. Their backgrounds, their sin, their embarrassment, their knowledge of how the others would view their words and actions, all of these gave them a strong and legitimate excuse to roll over in bed, to allow someone else to go see about Jesus, to hide within the confines of their sin and shame. Easter reminds us that the resurrected Jesus sees beyond our sin and shame. Peter and Mary Magdalene declare that no matter our past, our previous stumbles, our blatant acts of disloyalty, Jesus still beckons us to come and seek him. man was driving down the street desperately searching for a parking place so he wouldn't be late for an important meeting. In desperation, he gazed into the heavens and prayed, Oh, Lord, take pity on me. If you find me a parking place, I promise to go to church every Sunday and to give up drinking whiskey. Instantly, a parking place opened up right before him, and he took it. Whereupon he looked toward heaven again and said, Never mind, Lord, I found one. (laughs) Peter and Mary Magdalene could have made up all kinds of excuses not to acknowledge and seek Jesus. They could have clung to their sin and shame, but they believed the words of Jesus that no matter the sin of their past, Their future could be with him. Mary Magdalene discovers the empty tomb. She runs and tells Peter and the other disciple, possibly John. They sprint to the tomb, go in and find Jesus' burial clothes lying there passage says the other disciple upon seeing this believed but then he and Peter go back home but Mary lingers weeping believing Jesus body has been stolen she enters the tomb and discovers two angels who ask her why she is crying explaining she is fearful someone has moved Jesus body she turns to discover a man she supposes to be the gardener We do not know if her lack of recognition was because her eyes were swollen from crying or there was early morning fog or Jesus stood in a shaded area or that no one would have expected to encounter a resurrected person. But when he asks her for whom she is searching, she begs him that if he has moved Jesus, to just tell her where he has laid him. And then Jesus says to her, Mary.
recall that rush of good feeling that you get when someone remembers your name, especially someone you don't expect to remember. Or think of how we can hardly wait for our toddler to say dada or mama. And even when your baby grows up and has babies of her own, when she calls you daddy, it does something to you. Whether it is our spouse, our children, our boss, or someone unexpected remembers our name, it makes us feel good. It affirms they recognize us, value knowing who we are, want some kind of relationship with us. Mary. One word changed everything. It was not only that Mary Magdalene now knew Jesus was alive, but this resurrected Jesus knew who she was, cared enough to reveal himself to her, still loved her. Easter confirms that Jesus knows our names. The Savior of the world gave his life, was resurrected for you. Like us, Mary Magdalene was a less than perfect, sin-riddled human being. In the eyes of others, she was a woman whose word could not be trusted, but Jesus trusted her. He showed that by saying her name and having her announce his resurrection. Easter means that Jesus also knows your name. Pepsi-Cola Company built factories in many of the former Soviet states a long time before its great rival, the Coca-Cola Company, got in the market there. So when Coca-Cola opened its first factory in Georgia, the company decided to promote it as much as they could. They invited Edward Shevardnadze, the president of the country, for the celebration, and he agreed to be there. The great day came. The first bottle of Coke was about to roll off the assembly line. The president of the company country, the national TV channels, cameras, and reporters were all there. The first bottle arrives, they open it and hand it to Mr. Shevardnadze. He picks it up, sips some, and with the whole country watching says, great taste, just like Pepsi. <laughs> well, Jesus does not get us mixed up. He knows each of us by name, who we are and what we need. Easter proclaims that Jesus knows you. Jesus instructs Mary Magdalene to tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. Immediately she goes and announces, I have seen the Lord. There are multiple times in our lives when we wish we could see Jesus. Lord, just give me a glimpse. Doesn't need to be much. But I'd need to know you are there, that you care, that you even have an interest. Just give me a clue, a word, a hint. And so often we believe that we have just been let down, that we cannot and will not see him, that maybe he does not want me to see him. But I would suggest that this morning... You look around right now at the people who have come to worship to express their belief in Jesus' resurrection. Or you can look at the 102 Westminster members who helped feed and care for the two homeless families who stayed in our building through the GAIN program. 
Or you can drive over and see the 157 members who helped build our Habitat House. If you want to see Jesus, come on a Wednesday afternoon and watch those 120 elementary children in our It's Elementary program. Travel to Malawi and look at the deaf children who attend the only secondary school for deaf children in the country aided by the money this congregation provided. Go to the Dominican Republic. Watch the children flood into the school, adults into the church that you help build. Then go out to the Haitian Bates where the sugarcane workers live. There you will recognize Jesus in the face of those who have a restroom our mission team built or are free of disease or possess a pair of glasses because of the physicians from this church. Drive to United Ministries and discover Jesus in the lives of those who earn their GEDs in the building this church helped renovate. See Jesus at work through the teachers and administrators of our weekday school who lovingly care for 225 children. Watch our choir sing the Hallelujah Chorus this morning. Look into the lives being touched by the $700,000 this church will give to missions this year. Every time a pastor visits someone in the hospital, a circle provides a meal for a grieving widow. A funeral celebrates the resurrection. You can recognize Jesus in the work in the hearts and minds of his followers. If you and I want to see Jesus, we only have to look at how his followers make him visible. Rear Admiral Jeremiah Denton was a prisoner of war in North Vietnam. After many months in solitary confinement, his morale was flagging. His captors allowed prisoners to have nothing that reminded them of their religious faith. Even so, Denton had a small cross another prisoner had woven out of strands of bamboo. He kept it hidden inside a propaganda pamphlet along with a forbidden list of camp inmates. He only took the cross out at night to hold in his hands as he prayed. One day, in a surprise cell inspection, a guard found the little cross. With a cry of triumph, he tore it up and threw the pieces in an open sewer, glaring at Denton all the while. Standing off to one side, silently observing the scene, was a work crew of five or six aged Vietnamese men and women. They had been brought in from outside the prison to brick up a portion of each cell's ventilation opening as a security measure. The cards made Denton stand outside his cell while the crew completed their work. Denton tells what happened next in his own words. Immediately, I reached under the pallet and found the pamphlet. The list of prisoners was gone. Still angry, I began tearing the pamphlet apart. Then I felt a bulge among the pages. There was a cross, a new one, carefully and beautifully woven from the straw strands of a broom. Obviously, the work crew had made it. I shuddered at the thought of the punishment they would have suffered had they been caught. When his followers act with courageous love and commitment, we will have seen the Lord. Looking for Jesus. Mary Magdalene came looking for Jesus. She found him in an unexpected form as the resurrected Christ. We will also find Jesus in unexpected forms. Wherever justice is fairly administered, where every person is respected, loved, and treated equally, where the poor are fed and the sick receive medicine, where all people are provided opportunities to reach their fullest potential. This morning, 
each of us has come looking for Jesus. We hear him call our name in the worship and work of this congregation. But the question each of us must ask ourselves this morning is, when other people are looking for Jesus, do they see him? in me.